dive right into uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, and we're going to cover the church at Laodicea. And we're going to unpack a little bit of, of what this passage covers. There's so much here. And some of you know me by now. I am not usually uh, short when it comes to preaching. I'm not promising that I'm going to be short. I'm not promising that I'm going to be long. I neither affirm nor refute. Like, I'm not doing any of that stuff. Uh, I am going to do my best to get through the passage and, and to try to uh, do it in a timely fashion to honor your time uh, and get through some of these principles so that we can be helped and encouraged. Um, but uh, we're going to take our time, we're going to read it, and we're going to unpack it, and then try to apply it to our lives. Um, let's go ahead and begin reading together. Uh, if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to, to open it, to follow along. Uh, if you have a phone, uh, maybe pull up your Bible app, or if you have a tablet, pull that up. Uh, follow along as we read. I'll, I'll be referencing some other verses as well, and I want you uh, not to take my word for it, but let's consider God's word together. So verse number 14 you follow along as I read. The Bible says this, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Strong language. Verse number 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee, uh, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, Unto the churches. Father, I pray that you would be with us this morning. Lord, I pray that you would be with me as I communicate the scriptures. Lord, help for me to rightly divide it. Lord, help for me to, to clearly communicate it. And Lord, I pray that you'd help all of us that hears this message, that reads these scriptures. Lord, that we would apply it to our lives. Lord, we need your help with that. We need you to illuminate it. Help us to understand it. And then, Lord, give us the, the strength and the courage and the wisdom to help it to be brought to bear in our day-to-day -day lives. Lord, we want to draw closer to you. We want to be more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to please you this morning. Lord, I pray that if there is anybody under the sound of my voice here in this room or even on the live stream, Lord, that does not know you this morning as their personal Lord and Savior, that today would be that glorious day where they recognize their sinfulness and their wretchedness their blindness, their brokenness, Lord, that they would receive Jesus Christ for healing and forgiveness, Lord, for restoration, and that they would be restored to a right relationship with you and enjoy fellowship with you in a home in heaven. Lord, we pray that you'd be with Mark and Mag and their family while they're away from us. Lord, we're so thankful that you've given them to us. Lord, we pray that you would bless them. Lord, that you would protect them. Lord, that you would enable them in the days and the weeks and the months and the years ahead of us at Harvest Baptist Church. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we unpack this particular letter, uh, what you'll find is that there's a lot of similarities. If you start reading chapter 2 and read through chapter 3, you'll find the seven letters. And there's somewhat of a similar structure. They don't have all the same content, but they are structured in their letter form fairly similarly. And to make it super simple, it, it comprises of kind of an introduction or a greeting, if you will, and then there is the body of the letter, the, the essence of the letter, what's being addressed to that church, and then there's a conclusion. So we're going to kind of work our way through, uh, but we're going to kind of pull out some elements of each one of those sections, and, and hopefully as we pull out those elements and examine these truths and these principles, we'll understand them, but then we'll begin to ask the Lord to examine us 
and say, Lord, what is it in my life that is true about what you've said? What is missing, perhaps? Lord, what sin do I need to confess? Lord, what truth do I need to embrace and be comforted by? Uh, that's hopefully what we'll accomplish this morning. But as we look at the introduction, there's a couple things we, we need to see first before we can really understand and unpack the message that's being given to this church. As 21st century uh, American Christians, some of the historical context and the meaning behind some of the, the words that Jesus is using and some of the, the metaphors that he's using would, will be completely lost on us. And we would actually misinterpret uh, or misapply the scriptures if we don't fully understand that. So I will stay, say right off the bat, this is going to be a little more teachy than it is going to be preachy. But it's important that we understand a few things so that we can actually know, hey, why is he talking about lukewarm water? Why is he talking about anointing eyes? What's up with that? Well, it, it does uh, have definite relevance, and it makes sense when you understand some things about Laodicea, uh, if we understand some things about the Lord Jesus Christ and how he's described. So first of all, let's look at the audience and the addressor, or the, the one that is the author here, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously by the pen of John. But if you go back to verse number 14, it says, And unto the angel of the church of the, of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So first of all, this is being written to the angel of the Laodiceans, uh, that messenger, the pastor, if you will. But he's being addressed as the representative of the church. So yes, this can apply to him, but it can also apply to the church Broadly, and, and I think we should take that approach as we look at the, the greater passage. But we need to learn a few things about the city itself and what was true about it to further understand how Jesus addresses them. So, Laodicea. Laodicea was located in the, the Lycus River Valley in southwest Phrygia. You say, I have no idea what you're talking about, where that is. Google it. That's going to be my, no, uh, that's gonna be my answer for everything. Just Google it. Um, uh, no, it, to give you an idea, that's modern-day Turkey. Sometimes referred to that, that area referred to as Asia Minor. If you have your Bible, you may have a map in the back that has a map of maybe the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys in it. And you will find uh, this is one of the seven churches in that Asia Minor area. It's in the Lycus River Valley. The fact that it's in that river valley is important too. Uh, this, was a, this Lycus Valley was a common... Uh, route of travel among the people in that area uh, in those days. And the reason why is because people didn't travel through mountains, they traveled through valleys. And as such, Laodicea was an important city along these travel routes as an intersection city, especially for trade. And so there was a lot of people coming through, and trade was flourishing for the Laodiceans. More about that in a minute. But a couple of things we definitely need to know about Laodicea in order to understand this passage is, first of all, it had a very poor water supply. A very poor water supply. Uh, as travel and trade began uh, to grow uh, and the hub of Laodicea began to grow, the city began to grow, the surrounding bodies of water became insufficient. Uh, there was not good water in the area. The water was either dirty or it would dry up seasonally or the source itself was just impure and not suitable for drinking water or to be used uh, for, for healthy purposes. And so, as a result, Laodicea eventually it built an aqueduct system. And this was a unique system. It was actually built underground, and they would do that to help deter enemies from killing out their water source, which would be a way that they could siege the city and, and overtake it. Uh, but they built this aqueduct system underwater, and, and some... Uh, teach uh, historically that this was miles. This aqueduct system could have been upwards of five miles away, bringing water from the surrounding areas because their water system or their water supply was poor. But even this, this aqueduct system and this pipe system that brought water into the city was not good quality. Uh, it was really poor quality at best. Part of the reason why is because there were lo loads of chemicals uh, in, the, in the water, there were loads of impurities, uh, specifically calcium carbonate. 
and it would have these deposits, so much so that the pipes would actually, these deposits would build up and build up, and, and eventually even at times clog the, the aqueduct. Uh, and so it was inefficient as far as its function, but also inefficient, not super uh, refreshing or, or good to, to consumption. Even in, if you were to uh, study the archaeological uh, history of that particular area, you can see some of these aqueducts, and you can even see some of that build up to this day. And so this is important to keep in mind, especially as we get to the passage here. And not only was the, the water charged with impurities, but it was also lukewarm water. It, it came from miles away. So whether that source was a hot water spring or whether it was a cool water source, traveling for such a long distance, that water would either cool down or it would warm up you know moderately and it would become a lukewarm temperature uh, and, and it was kind of one of those things where it wasn't the best of either and, and it was moderate and mediocre we'll, we'll say more about the water later but we need to understand that their water supply was not a very good supply and the system that they had to bring water in was not a, a good system. What else do we need to know about Laodicea? We need to know that they had a thriving wool industry. They had uh, several industries that were thriving and doing extremely well in that region. Remember, it's a high travel area. Uh, it's a high trade area. And they had certain industries in that local region that were doing really well because of, of what they pr uh, provided and the demand that was there for it. And so the wool industry, and, and in this wool industry, the major product was soft, sought-after, glossy, black wool. It was a black wool that was very sought-after. It was used for carpets and for clothing, both locally. And In fact, this was something they prided themselves in and in, in their textile uh, industry, and they would wear these clothing, and these were clothing. This was clothing of the wealthy and of the rich. Uh, and so they, they, they used it locally, but they also exported it broadly. This was sought after uh, and was sold at, at high value. And not only did they have a, a thriving wool industry, but they also had a, a respected medical school at Laodicea. Uh, and this particular medical school was famous for its ophthalmology department, uh, the, the treatment for the eyes. Uh, and the specific um, fame, claim to fame, so to speak, in that department was this eye salve that they were able to develop. This was almost like a, a, that you would use minerals and make a paste, uh, and this would be rubbed on the eyes, almost like an ointment, uh, and it wouldn't cure blindness. Only Jesus can do that. Remember, he spits into the clay, and he makes a paste, so to speak, and he rubs it in the eyes and heals that man of his blindness. Uh, they can't do that, but this, this uh, eye salve, this, this uh, eye treatment was good, and it had healing and, and, and helpful qualities to it for those that had eye ailments. And so this was obviously helpful, became very famous, but it also helped be very lucrative. Uh, I'm sure if you've been to the doctor, you would understand that there are costs associated with medical treatment. Nothing new under the sun. That was the case in those days as well. Uh, and so they were able to sell this eye salve and make a healthy profit off of it. The last thing that we need to understand before we continue into the passage is that they had a lucrative banking industry, which makes sense. They were doing very well with the wool industry. They were doing well with their medical industry, which in turn helped them to do well in their banking industry. It was a center for currency exchange and money lending. Uh, so the city was very wealthy. Obviously, they could exchange currency. They could lend money and uh, get a return off of the interest. And they had a, a, a wealth of supply when it came to extra cash on hand. And so they used that to their advantage. Uh, this city was so wealthy, history tells us, that there was an earthquake in Laodicea and the surrounding area in 60 AD that, that leveled the city. Uh, they had to completely rebuild. It was devastating. As you could imagine, uh, any city uh, experiencing an earthquake and how that could damage that city. But history tells us that they were so wealthy that they, ne they needed no external aid to pay for the rebuilding of, that, their, of their beautiful city. Uh, even a Roman histori uh, historian uh, makes account of the fact that they uh, were able to rebuild and needed no Roman aid to accomplish it. So this was evidence of the fact they were very wealthy, they were very self-sufficient, 
They were very capable of handling their own, taking care of their own, uh, existing, and doing well at that. So these three industries and the water supply, that poor water supply, all plays a part in this letter. So there's the context. We went to, to you know, history class. We understand a little bit about Laodicea. Now that's really going to help unlock the rest of the passage. Uh, so that's about Laodicea. Now let's understand a little bit about this, this introduction that Jesus gives. We see this repeatedly as far as the element of it in the other letters is that there, there's an address to the church and it's named. But then there's also this naming of Jesus and he's described in different ways to the churches. And that description kind of has a correlation to what, how he's addressing or what he's addressing with the church. So in this case, if you look at it, verse number 14 again, it says, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. What does that mean? Well, let's, let's break it apart. The Amen and the true and faithful witness. I think that those ideas go hand in hand. That word Amen, we just heard it sung, right? Uh, a moment ago. Sometimes when we say Amen... What we're saying is, you know, if I say something that's not halfway stupid and you say amen, um, what you're saying is like, I am in agreement with that. Let that be so. That is, that's right. Uh, so there's this idea of it has a close correlation between what's true and what's reliable. In, in the Gospels, we see the term that Jesus would often use when he would address uh, his disciples or maybe address the crowd. He would say, verily, verily, I say unto you. What he was doing was employing this same term, and it was that he was saying, truly, truly, what I'm about to say, the pronunciation that follows, this is true, and it's reliable. That makes sense? That's the idea here. And, and so what Jesus is saying, he is, I am the amen. I am faithful. I am the true witness. What I'm, so don't forget who I am. And, and this is important because what he's saying is, is that I'm about to say some things to you, church. It's going to be painful. It's going to be a gut punch. In fact, it's going to be something that's going to totally knock you off your feet because you thought one thing, and I'm going to tell you something entirely different concerning yourself. You thought you were this, but I'm telling you, you're this. And it's going to almost be unbelievable. It's going to, it's going to be offensive. Can this be true? Really, is, what he, is this reliable? Does Jesus know what he's talking about? He does. Jesus knows exactly what he's talking about. He is, he is the amen. He's the faithful and the true witness. And we, church, would do well to heed what he has to say. So he's the faithful and true witness. The Laodiceans were struggling with their attention towards Jesus. They had developed in, in a, um, an indifference towards Jesus. They had marginalized Jesus off to the side. They compartmentalized Jesus to a box. Uh, and we'll see that in the next term that he uses concerning himself. Notice it again in verse 14. He says, he's the beginning of the creation of God. What does that mean? What is he saying? Is he saying, oh, is this a verse that teaches us that Jesus is, is a created being? He's not. Jesus is not a created being. But this is a phrase or a term that would be employed to describe Jesus not as being created, but rather he is the first in a series. He's beginning in that sense. He's the first in the series. Or he's the leader. Or the idea would be he's the premier or the preeminent one. Of all that God has made and created, Jesus is above all of it. He's the, premier, he's the premier one. He's the preeminent one. He is the most important one. Turn to Colossians chapter number 1 real quick. I want you to see it. This passage really elaborates on this concept well, and I want you to see it. Colossians chapter 1, and look at verse 15. It says here, speaking of Jesus, by the way, the, the book of Colossians was written to, to the church at Colossae, but in chapter 4 of Colossians, Paul told the, the, the church at Colossae to take this letter and read it to the believers that lay at the sea in church. So this is something that they would have heard before. So Jesus here is hitting a home on a message here that perhaps they were struggling with uh, in, in more than just a moment of time, but in a season of time. 
But notice verse 15, it says, Who, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created. So Jesus is not created, he created all things. That are in the heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. That's huge, don't forget that. We are created by him and for him. The Laodicean church was missing both. That, they, that Jesus is creator, and as creator, he's preeminent. And as the creature, we exist to live for the creator. You follow that? Notice what it goes on to say, verse 17. And he is before all things. There's that, that idea of before. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. There's that idea of beginning again. The firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. You get what Jesus is saying? Go ahead back to Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is saying, I am the preeminent one. You've forgotten that. You've forgotten that I am the faithful, true witness. I am the amen. You've forgotten that I am the preeminent one. Man, let's just pause right there. Is it true of my life and your life that Jesus is the preeminent one? Is Jesus the preeminent one when it comes to my schedule? Could you look at your schedule, maybe as an individual, maybe as a family, say, man, when you look at my schedule, look at a week, look at a month, look at a quarter, look at the whole year. Would it reflect that Jesus is preeminent? When you do your finances... When you look at, hey, here's my, my income, here's my expenditures, and as we break down these expenditures, man, there's, there's obviously some non-negotiables, right? We've got to take care of some things. But before we've got to take care of some things, we have obligation to the giver of all of our income, right? Would our finances reflect that we view Jesus and serve Jesus as the preeminent one? That's a sobering thought. And I think that we need to take that truth and we need to examine our lives because that's essentially getting at the root of what Jesus is addressing with this church is like, you are living in such a way that you've, you've lost sight of me. You've lost sight of my preeminence and your duty and your responsibility to live a, a, with fervor towards me as the preeminent one. And so we see there the author in the audience. Let's go now to the body of the letter and look at Jesus's assessment. Notice at the beginning of it in verse number 15. He says, I know thy works. So what is Jesus assessing? He's assessing the works of this church. Now, interestingly, this church is the only church that has no commendation. Nothing positive is said as far as, hey, good job. boy, slap on the back. Some of the churches, they got that solely. There was nothing to, to rebuke concerning those churches in the other letters. Some of the churches got a mix. Hey, you're doing some things good. a boy, keep it up. There's some things you're doing that you need to clean up a bit. You need to give that some attention, and let's make sure that we're correcting that. But this church, Jesus just says, I know that works. That is both a sobering and comforting principle in general. You know, what does Jesus know about you, and what does Jesus know about me? Man, we can fool people. We're really good at it. We can dress the part. We can talk the talk. We can, we can make sure we're doing all the things we're supposed to be doing. But at the end of the day, Jesus, he sees through it all. He sees you as, as, as you truly are. In fact, he's, a lot of times we don't even see ourselves as we truly are. Jesus sees us as our true selves. And we need to examine or at least solicit the examine of, uh, examination of God and say, Lord, like the psalmist said, Lord, try me. Know me. See if there be any wicked way in me. We, we need to have that spirit. But Jesus is saying here to this church, hey, I know your works. And, and, I, and this is a knowledge that's based upon observation. So thank God that he's not indifferent towards us. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? We may be indifferent towards God at times. We may forget about God. Uh, we, we may marginalize God. We may, you know, put... Uh, God on the top shelf and forget about him, but he never does that with us. He has a watchful eye on you and me, and praise the Lord for it. That it should be comforting, but it should also be convicting because, man, how am I living? 
when he does examine my life, what does he find? And as he examines this church, there are some things that need to be addressed. And so Jesus addresses them. First of all, he finds that they're lukewarm. They're a lukewarm church. Notice what he says in verse number 15 again. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Uh, again, some strong language, but here we go. Let's apply what we've learned historically to what Jesus is saying. The Laodicean church is being likened unto their water supply. Nearby was uh, Hierapolis, another city. It was a sister city. And also nearby was Colossae. And Hierapolis was known for its hot springs. Uh, it was known for the waters there that were good. They were famous for healing powers. It, even to this day, that is true. People went there because they were good, because they had properties of rehabilitation and restoration. In Colossae, the, the, they were known for their cool waters. The water, it, it, there was a cold perennial stream, uh, which made it the earliest settlement in that area, and the water was refreshing and clear. These are being contrasted with the water at Laodicea. That's why he's talking about, hey, you're not hot, you're not cold. There would be an obvious association or understanding for the Laodiceans there that, oh, we're familiar with hot, what hot, qual uh, hot water qualities are. Hierapolis has that. We're, we're familiar with cool water qualities are. Uh, that's at um, Colossae. And what he's saying is you're not either. You're lukewarm. And the lukewarm water that flowed for miles through a filthy aqueduct to Laodicea, it was not enough to relax or to restore. It wasn't cool enough to quench. The water at Laodicea was foul, and it made people nauseous. In fact, when it was the, probably the, the worst quality about the city. When visitors would come, they would taste that water, and they would spit it out. They would spit it, oh, this is gross. And so what Jesus was doing is he's comparing Laodicea, the Christians in the church there. You're like that water. You're not hot or cold. You're, you're lukewarm, and I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Now, we don't want to read into that what's not there. I think Jesus is using metaphoric language. He's taking these illustrations. Jesus, the, the master at uh, illustrations and object lessons. And I think he's using their context. We do that with our children, right? We, when we're trying to teach our kids, we'll try to take things uh, that is, you know, uh, understandable to them or common to them and, and use those as a platform to teach a principle to help them grow. Jesus is doing the same thing here. Is that, hey, what's he getting at? Your works are not zealous. I've, I know your works and you have lost your fervor for me. I'm not the preeminent one anymore. Your agenda is the pre it's taken preeminence. Your wealth has taken preeminence. Your comfort has taken preeminence. Your self-reliance has taken preeminence. Man, that's convicting, isn't it? Because that could be true of me in my life. And, and he's saying, you, you've lost your passion You've, you're lacking and, and losing, and that's the idea of the water, by the way. The hot water had purpose. It had redeeming qualities. It was useful. The cold water had purpose. It had redeeming wa uh, qualities. It was useful. Lukewarm water that was coming through that aqueduct at Laodicea, it was despised. It was disgusting. They didn't really want to use it, but it's all they had. That makes sense? And so Jesus was saying, you're lacking in your passion. You're lacking in your usefulness. You're, God has a purpose for us, Harvest Baptist Church. God has called us to take the gospel to this community. He's, he's called us to take the gospel to this state and to this country and to this world. And I'm so thankful for the history that we have here as, as a church for our missions program. And even just this past October for the commitments that were made. And hundreds of thousands of dollars are given on a yearly basis so that the gospel can go around the world. And praise the Lord for that. God's called us to that. But here's the thing, we can be doing some right things, but are we doing it with the right spirit? Are we doing it with zeal? Are we doing it with passion? Are we doing the things that God has called us to? Dad, are you doing what God's called you to? Mom, are you doing what God's called you to? Hey, young person, have you figured out, are you learning what God's calling you to? And, and you can find that out right here. You can find that out by talking to mom and dad. You can find that out by 
availing yourself in submitting yourself to authority. But here's the deal. God wants you to pursue the purpose he's called you to. This church lost sight of that. They weren't zealous anymore. They were lukewarm. They lost their zeal. They lost their usefulness. God wants us to be useful. You see, God has called us uh, to, uh, he's created us unto good works. Ephesians 2 teaches that. Uh, James chapter 2 teaches us that he wants our faith not, uh, he wants our our faith to have works, and he says faith without works is dead. So he wants our faith to be a demonstrable faith, that it's, it's clear you can look at my works, you can see, you can hear my words, you can see my activity, you can observe my demeanor, you can see my zeal, and you know that I'm a, I'm a sold out child of God, and that Jesus is the preeminent one in my life. Is that true of your life? Not only do we see that the church there was um, lukewarm, but quickly we see that they're not fulfilling God's desire. Did you see that part? I, I would that you were hot or cold. It, when we lose sight of Jesus and, he's the, he, and we don't see him as the preeminent one as he is, what happens is we fail to fulfill his desire. And do you know that's the very reason why we were created? We, we, we just read it in Colossians that they were created by him and for him. You read Revelation 4, we'll see it, that all creation was created for God's pleasure, for Jesus' pleasure. That's why we exist. And when we get our focus off of Jesus and we keep our focus on ourselves and we become self-conceited, when we deceive ourselves and think, man, everything's good and hunky-dory, I'm rich and I'm wealthy and I'm increased with goods and we associate gain with godliness, man, we're in a world of hurt. We're missing it altogether. We're not fulfilling the desire of our Savior that this church wasn't doing that and they were self-conceited they were deceived they thought one thing of themselves and they were grossly wrong notice it verse number 16 i'm sorry verse 17 because thou sayest i am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked that that phrase there and knowest not that thou art the 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 word for thou is emphatic in the greek i mean it's like you are the one that you don't see yourself it's clear to everybody around you. It's clear to me, but you don't see it. Thou art actually wretched, and you are, um, what's he say? You're wretched and miserable. The, the, the idea of, of wretched is uh, in trouble or in affliction. Miserable means pity. Uh, the ob- you are deserving to be the object of pity, which would have been so contrary to the, to the Laodicean mindset. They were rich. They were wealthy. They were the envy of everybody else. They didn't need anyone. Everybody came to them when they had need. They were the ones giving the loans out. They were the ones doing the healing. They were the ones that had it all figured out. They were used to being needed. And and Jesus was saying, you need me. You got it all wrong. You're deceiving yourself. And I, I would say this, church, we deceive ourselves the moment we think we don't need Jesus. The moment we think, man, I got it all figured out. I know what I'm doing. I don't need to pray anymore. I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need church anymore. I can just listen to some podcasts. Nothing wrong with listening to podcasts. But this is the institution that, that Christ ordained. He died for the church. He loves the church. And we should be committed to it. We should be zealous in it. Uh, we should be useful in it. They were deceiving themselves, and they, they, they were woefully wrong. The ch- this church was so rich in its own esteem, but it was utterly bankrupt in the sight of God. Whew. Sometimes our view of ourself and the view that the Lord has of us can be completely opposite. And what a sad thing when that is so. May that never be said of Harvest Baptist Church. Maybe that, may that never be said of your family. May that never be said of you. Seek to be in alignment with God's estimation, to be in alignment with his word, to be yielded to his spirit. Wherever that, whatever you're doing and whatever arena that is in your life, seek to align yourself with the Lord. And lastly, you've listened well. Notice this last part. What does Jesus tell them to do? He he counsels them. Verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me. Come back to me. You've marginalized me. you put me on the shelf. And now I'm no longer preeminent. Now you've lost your zeal. Now you've lost your usefulness. And what's the remedy? Jesus says, come back to me. Notice that in that passage, he, he correlates to the industries, right? Hey, you think you're rich, but you're, you're actually spiritually poor. So if you come to me, I will make you spiritually rich, which is far better than the world's riches. 
You think that you, you're comfortable and good, but no, you're miserable. You need my riches. You think that you're clothed. You're wearing that black wool, that, them black garments. Man, everybody's paying top dollar for that. But let me give you white raiment. Let me give you my clothing. Let me give you my covering, and you will have spiritual um, coverings and righteousness. And then he talks about put eye salve. You're spiritually blind. You, you boast about your, your medical field uh, 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 healings, but you're blind. You need my eye salve. Come to me. Can I encourage you, church family? What, can I encourage you to do what Jesus is telling this church to do? He says, buy of me. Come to me. I will help you. I will lead you. I will guide you. I will use you. I will bless you. And that's what he goes on to say in the rest of this passage. Because in verse 9, he says, repent. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Here's the reality. Every one of us is guilty of this at some point or another in our lives. But what's the answer? Go back to Jesus. Repent. That, the repent means to, to make a 180. You're going the wrong way, but come back to Jesus. Turn around. And he says, I love you. I love that. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke. This is not Jesus being heavy-handed. This is not Jesus saying, hey, I'm looking for people that I can just zap with lightning bolts and you need to be fearful of me. No, what he's doing, he's lovingly holding the mirror up and saying, you're a mess. Do you see it? And let me show you how to fix your hair. Let me show you how to, 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 to make that better. Let me show you. I, if I did not love you, I'd leave you to yourself. But I love you, therefore I rebuke you. By the way, guys, that's a great principle. If somebody's coming to you lovingly and caringly, don't push that away. Loving rebuke is a healthy thing and a helpful thing. We need to be willing to receive it and when necessary, to repent. Then he reminds them of, their, of the honor to the church. Uh, he loves them and reminds them of the honor that he will bestow upon them. Verse 21 or I'm sorry, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. See, the, Jesus is at the door. He's saying, hey, will you respond? Will you receive what I'm saying to you? Will you repent? It, he lingers in patience. I love that imagery of the Lord. And again, this is metaphoric. There's people have built messages off of this that Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. It doesn't say that. But the essence is he is calling you and he is knocking, and he, he's asking, if any will come, and if any will open the door, if any will hear my voice. And so if Jesus is tugging on your heart this morning, don't ignore the call. Answer him. Respond to him. Repent. Commune with him. He did, that's what happened. This church had, was, had fallen away from their communion and their fellowship and that sweet union with their Savior, and he was calling them back to it. In verse 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. And so this was a common theme in all the other letters. He would remind them of their blessing as a church that, hey, I love you. I'm going to bless you. You can overcome as I have overcome. There's hope here. There's mercy here. There's grace here. It's never hopeless in Christ. And then he ends, as he does with the other ones, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto churches. It's a last plea for attention. Hey, God's trying to get our attention. Will we respond?